and it is officially time to start. It is 3.30 um, UK time. So welcome everyone. Welcome to Poplar. So we are live from Poplar. Feel free to use the, the chat, ask me any questions. I might know or I might not know, but I'll try. And today we're here to talk about Elizabeth Stride. So I'm, sh I'm pretty sure everyone here would already know who Elizabeth is, but if you don't know, she's the third Jack the Ripper victim. Well, the third, if we consider only the five canonical victims. She's the first one of the night of the double event. But today we're not here to talk about her, her tragic uh, uh, murder, but we're here to talk about her life. Some of you might have uh, done that tour with me before. We've done it in different locations. The first time we were to our uh, resting place, not too far down that way, the East London Cemetery. Then we've done the next one in uh, St. Giles, because that's where she got married. And today we are in Poplar, because she lived here for a little while. Of course, it's not her full uh, uh, life that she spent here. You know, you cannot, re you cannot condense anybody's life in a couple of streets. But yeah, that's for me the opportunity to show you Poplar. I know there's quite a few of you that wanted to see Poplar. I hope you won't be disappointed. It's not as nice as you'd imagine. Sadly, the, uh, uh, the area has been dramatically bombed through the Second World War, so it's probably much more modern. If you've been watching uh, Called the Midwife on, uh, 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 on the BBC or, or elsewhere, it's, um, it's not actually filmed in here. Although it's meant to happen here in, in Poplar, it's not filmed here, because you won't see many of those Victorian streets anymore around here. Oh, welcome, Kay. You're new. Nice to have you on board, Kay. I hope I get you uh, addicted to those lives and, uh, and you'll join uh, many more. Anyway, before we start, I wanted to, uh, uh, to, to give a little bit of credit to Harley Rubenthal. Uh, some of you might know she's the lady that wrote the book The Five about the Ripper victims. And she's done a tremendous amount of research about their lives. So I just wanted to give her a little, uh, a little bit of credit because a lot of the information I'm going to tell you today, I got it from, from her book. Anyway, let's go. Let's flip this camera around. So we're here by the canal that goes down to the Limehouse Bassin. And if you went down this way, you'll end up at uh, Stratford. So for the ones that don't know, we are in uh, East London. We're just above the docks. So that's why it was such a poor area in, uh, in Victorian times, because that's where a lot of the dock workers used to live. And... Um, we might, uh, we might have spoken about those dock work workers before. Um, they, were, uh, well, they were not making a lot of money because they never knew when they were going to work. Because they never knew how many boats would arrive that day. So they had to wake up in the morning, go on queue to maybe get a shift, maybe not. So it was a pretty poor area at the time. And it still is. It still is one of, one of the poorest areas in London. But today it's an interesting mix because you've got, uh, you've got uh, a lot of social housing and a lot of uh, 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 communities that are not, uh, um, not that rich, but you also have some fancy flats in the middle. So it's, uh, it's an interesting um, area today. Very, uh, very residential, as you'll see. Anyway, let's, uh, let's dive in. So Elizabeth, she was not actually from around those parts. She was born in, uh, in Sweden. So she was, uh, uh, she was born Elizabeth Gustav daughter in, uh, in a small town in Sweden that's uh, about 16 kilometers from, um, um, what is it called, uh, Gothenburg. So the, um, the, the little town is Torslanda, if anyone, if anyone knows uh, Sweden. She was born in a farm in a in a family that was uh, uh, not, not poor, you know, they had, uh, they had a, 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 decent, a decent farm. She had, uh, she had some sleep siblings. She had an older sister, actually, that went to work into service. And her sister was lucky because she ended up marrying the, um, the, the, the fam well, one of the boys in the family she worked with. Um, that was, uh, that was a, a a lucky move at the time you know you know when we talk about the victorian servants um we often imagine a bit uh, a bit like danton abbey you know upstairs downstairs and it was not necessarily always the case it was um not that 
straightforward, you know, the line between the servants and the, and, uh, the family. Um, in, 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 some, uh, in some families in Sweden, they actually hired too many staff because they, uh, it was a, a bit of a um, status uh, uh, symbol. You know, you could, if you had a lot of maids, you could, uh, you could show that you were doing well for yourself. Um, and uh, Natasha. So sometimes it was not that bad. And a lot, a lot of young girls would actually go and spend a few years into service, almost like an apprenticeship, you know, for, for later, for when they would themselves become the, the, the lady of the household, you know. And um, so that's what Elizabeth did as well. She went, uh, she went to work in, uh, in Gothenburg for her, for her family. And uh, we don't know what happened there. It probably wasn't too hard in terms of work because it was a small household and, uh, um, and they, have a, they had another, another maid. But, you know, those young girls, they wouldn't be... Well, they were not really allowed to go out and go to the pubs, so they wouldn't really be meeting many boys or future husband. So whatever happened to her, we don't know. She ended up finding herself pregnant. Now, it's very possible that it was actually uh, the, her boss, you know, her boss or the son of the family or, or anyone in that household because those young girls, they had many opportunities to get, to, to find themselves alone with men. Whether it was consensual or not, we don't know. She probably had an affair with the young men of the family and, and, uh, and you know, the, the, the bystander of the time were horrible. I mean, the dynamic between men and women were so unfair because a man could have a sexual relationship with anybody. Sometimes they would actually, you know, keep their mistress and pay for them. And, and, but sometimes they would just dump them. And then those lives were ruined because at the time, if you fell pregnant out of wedlocks, you were screwed. I mean, all your prospect of life, uh, 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 marriage, all of that was, was gone. The building straight ahead, it looks like it was a church, but it's not anymore. It's uh, apartments. So that's quite cool. Oh, thank you, Natalie. So, the, um, so she found herself pregnant and she found herself losing, the, losing her job, losing or departing. We, we don't know. Um, so whether she had an affair or whether she was maybe abused, we have no idea. What we do know is that because she was pregnant and, and not married, she ended up being, well, classified as a, as a loose woman. And at the time in, um, in, in, in Gothenburg, but in many, uh, in many cities across the Europe, they, they were getting worry, very worried about venereal disease, so mainly syphilis. And they blamed the sex workers. It was always the ladies that were to blame. Of course, never the gentlemen, never the customers. But determining who is or is not a sex worker is actually quite difficult. So it would be very easy to find yourself classified as a, as a sex worker when you were not. And uh, you, had the, 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 you had two groups. You had the one that were registered and were like almost certainly sex worker. And you had all those loose women that were probably sex workers. They were both under the register of shame. It was a register that they had, legally, they had to be registered in. The, um, and someone could snitch on you. And so if you, your neighbor spotted you being pregnant and, and you have no husband, that's very probably what happened to Elizabeth, they would tell the authorities and you would find yourself on the registry of shame. So that's, uh, that's exactly what happened to Elizabeth. Sadly, at the age of 21, she found herself on that registry of shame and she became Alman Kivna 97. So Alman Kivna would translate into public woman, public woman 97. And then she had to present herself at, uh, at the police station every so often to be checked in for venereal disease. Oh yeah, absolutely barbaric. She was not allowed to live a life of, uh, of um, uh, 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 well, any, uh, any excess really. And when I say present herself at the, 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 the police station, I mean, we're talking lots, dozens of ladies coming in, stripping naked in front of those officers, queuing naked to be examined. Um, 
And if there was not enough space inside, they would make them queue outside in the courtyard with all those officers looking at them. And then the speculums or whatever they used to, to, to check a lady after another, that, there's no way that could have been cleaned properly. There's no way. So they were being checked from, for syphilis. And it's actually probably those speculum or, or those things that would actually transmit it from one lady to another. And eventually through one of those uh, appointments, they found out she had some genital warts. So that's one of the signs of syphilis. So sadly, uh, she, was, uh, she was positive for, for syphilis. So she had been sent to some kind of those hospital. It's more like a prison, really, but let's call it a hospital. Uh, those um, uh, hospital for, for uh, uh, contagious uh, 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 sexual diseases. And um, she, she lost her baby, sadly. The, she gave birth to a... Uh, a stillborn uh, baby girl. She left the, you know, you still have to do a birth certificate and she left the, the space of the dad empty. So she's really taken to the grave, the name of the man that, that put her in that situation. And uh, well, with the different stages of syphilis, and it's probably the man, that, the man that got her pregnant, but we don't know that for sure. But then once you were on that register of shame, it was mission impossible to find yourself an actual job, you know, a position, because people would know. So very often those young girls, whether they were prostitutes or not before to be registered as such, uh, they often uh, very sadly ended up having to, to go in the trade of the trade that they were accused of doing. So Elizabeth did find herself selling her body, her body in, in Gothenburg. Um, and... Uh, uh, so yes, uh, um, out of you know, out of the the, the 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 victims of the Ripper, we we said that they were prostitutes. Most of them, we don't know for sure. With Elizabeth, sadly, she was indeed um, selling selling her body at some point. This used to be a graveyard, by the way. This was the graveyard of um, Saint Mary and Saint um, Saint Mary's and Joseph Church. I don't know why they have to. Usually there's only one cent. And straight ahead, see the HSBC building? So this is Canary Wharf. We've been there together on my dark tales of the dogs. So you can see the contrast between Poplar here and the Isle of Dogs with all those fancy banks and, uh, and uh, finances uh, building. So yeah, poor Elizabeth finds herself uh, uh, selling her body. Um, and she had, a, she had a great opportunity. At the time, there were some people that started to care about those sex workers, that, that started to try to help or understand how they ended up here. And one of the ways to get yourself out of that registry of shame was to actually get a job. If you had an employer that could uh, vote for you, you know, say that, um, that uh, they want you off the register, you could and luckily one lady offered Elizabeth a job and she got her away from the register of shame so she got a job as a, as a servant um, still in Gothenburg at this point let me show you Joseph Joseph is here with his carpenting tool today we'll talk about another carpenter Elizabeth's future husband is uh, he was a carpenter we'll talk about him in a little while so she got a job, but she's still, she's still in, uh, in Gothenburg. So, uh, you know, she could run into former customers on the street. She could run into the police officers on, on the street that had examined her and judged her. So there was no way she could get a, a new start. You know, she was still the, 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 the public woman, basically. So she, uh, she then had an opportunity. She heard about a position as a servant in London. And she jumped on the opportunity, you know, that, that was the opportunity to come for a, a new start, you know. On the streets of London, no one would know her terrible and tragic past. And she could, um, she could just start again, you know, like, uh, like anybody else without judgment or, or, or anything like that. So she took that position. Uh, uh, we don't know. We know it's from a, a rich family around Hyde Park, but we don't know much about, um, about that. And she probably had an affair with the brother of the, the employer, uh, a, a police officer. We don't know that for sure, but ac according to her, her later boyfriend, she might have kept in contact with him for many, many years. Mary is here. 
So this is a Catholic church, by the way. And um, so she, uh, she ended up leaving that job. We don't really know why. Maybe because of the affair, we don't know why. I mean, she was a very pretty lady, uh, even even from, we don't have any photographs of her, but, um, well, apart from the post-mortem, of course, but even on the post-mortem, post with the, 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 the physical traces of syphilis on her face, she still, she still has some, some pretty, you know, lines. And um, she, uh, she then took another job as a servant again uh, with, a, with a lady. And that's at that point when she, um, she met a, a carpenter. Uh, uh, John Stride. John Stride was, uh, he was, he was uh, originally from, uh, from Sheerness in, uh, on the Isle of Shippey in Kent. His dad had some uh, property, so he was not well off, but um, his dad was. John worked as a carpenter in, um, in the area of uh, St Giles. And some of you were with me, you know, when we did um, uh, Houston Square a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the, the Houston Square mystery. Well, that area where a lot of uh, uh, furniture makers and uh, uh, John Stride was one of them. And uh, he, uh, he, we don't know where they met for sure, maybe in a coffee house or something like that. We don't really know what she liked in him because he was a bit older. He would have been in his late 40s. Um, she was uh, a young, pretty, 20-something years old that just had an affair with a police officer. Uh, maybe, maybe because he looked stable and maybe just nice, we don't really know. They, uh, they got married at St. Giles, so the, the church is uh, still there today. Last time we did that tour, we, uh, we went there. And uh, she, Sandrine is saying she was pretty clever and spoke several languages. Yes, she was very, very pretty. And she, well, she probably spoke to Yiddish because later on she ended up working for some Jewish families and she might have learned that in Gothenburg. So, yes, yeah, she would have been um, probably, uh, 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 let me see which side I should cross. Yeah, let's, let's go this way. And um, so she married, uh, she married John and together they decided to open a coffee house here in Poplar. On the street we were on, uh, but we're still on it now, um, Upper North Street. So we don't, I don't really know exactly where because it's all been renumbered. But on the street we've just, uh, we've just uh, walked along. She had her coffee shop with John. So, you know, finally, all the, you know, for many years she had been working for others. She had been cleaning, dusting. Finally, she could do that for her own business. Uh, unfortunately, so the coffee houses, they, ha they had evolved. It's not the same coffee houses that they had 200 years earlier when it was only for men and, uh, and, uh, and only for coffee. Um, and then in the, in the 1700s, you often have Brussels upstairs and alcohol. In the, uh, in the 19th century, it was, um, it was different. Co the coffee houses usually were for teetotalers, so no alcohol. And you'll have food as well, so hot food, uh, kidneys, or, or whatever it might be. And uh, bear in mind, at the time, a lot of people love those, those coffee houses because they might live in a small accommodation with many other people. They might not have much space for themselves, so people would spend hours in there. And uh, it could be where they've met, we don't know that for sure. And. Uh, the problem with their first coffee house here, though, is that there were a lot of co competition from the local pubs. The thing is, although those, those establishments were popular, some people like a good old drink. So that was not a very successful uh, adventure. So they've decided to move. Uh, they bought a, oh, let me cross again. They bought another coffee house. Um, uh, uh, a little bit, uh, a, a little bit further than I'll show you in a moment. So they left that street to move around the corner uh, to have less competition. But uh, there were actually a lot of pubs on that street as well. And um, it is at this point. So she's living here with John. No babies. Well, probably because of uh, of the later stages of, of syphilis. It's much, it's much harder to get pregnant with syphilis. You'd have to understand that at the time they didn't fully understand the, the disease. 
They believed that once the symptoms were gone, you were uh, cured. No, you were not. Um, we don't know whether she ever told John about it. She probably didn't, you know, if she didn't have any physical symptoms at that point. Um, but it wouldn't have helped in, in the... Um, well, it wouldn't have helped them to start a family, that's for sure. So she probably had quite a few miscarriages. So no babies. And uh, it is at that point, when they are uh, living here in Poplar, that there was a tragedy that struck uh, London. In, uh, in 1878, it is the Princess Alice disaster. So the Princess Alice was um, a leisure ship, a leisure boat, that would go every morning from London Bridge to Gravesend in Kent and Sheerness and back up. In Gravesend you had a massive garden called Rocheville Gardens with a lot of attractions, like the, the, the skeleton of a big um, uh, whales and, um, and a lot of uh, um, attractions for, for kids and families. So that was uh, a, a lovely day out. And on that boat you'd have couples courting or groups of kids. Sadly, there were quite a few groups of kids that day. Um, and uh, so they, they went all the way down. You, you had the return. It, you didn't have to, to jump on the same ship. You could come back at 5.30 or 6.30. Um, the Princess Alice, though, was quite a famous ship, so a lot of people actually choose to be on the Princess Alice just to see the, the ship. And very sadly, that day, um, they were coming back towards uh, London Bridge uh, uh, about 8 p.m. And uh, the, there was uh, another boat that came right in front of them, a commercial boat called the, the Bywood Castle. And it was empty, so it was actually floating quite high on the river. And they, they couldn't really see what was in front of them in the dark. And uh, that boat went, went right into the Princess Alice. And it literally cut the, um, the, uh, the boat in, in two half, and the Princess Alice sank with all its passengers. A lot of people did not know how to swim at the time. And even if you did know how to swim, remember the, the Thames River was used as a public sewer. So it was full of human waste. So some people did survive, but died later on of uh, infections. We don't know how many dead, between 90 and 160, but horrible, horrible. And those bodies washed out on the river shore for months. And imagine having to identify those, those bodies. You know, if you're missing you, your uncle or you, your cousin, you'd have to walk through like lines of dead bodies bloated by the water. Um, eventually, they had a massive burial. They kept the items of clothing so you could still identify them later on. But horrible disaster that shocked London and that also led to quite a bit of uh, charity to help the, family that were, the families that were affected. Anyway, I'll tell you a bit more in a while about why this was relevant. But for now, let me show you a horse on a stick. So this is the white horse. If you don't know the story behind it, it's literally just a horse on a stick. I'm going to have to get my umbrella out. Um, the, uh, actually, some of you might know, I like to, look, to, to check the Google reviews of, any, uh, uh, of anything really on, on, on Google. If you look at this, uh, this one, some of the reviews are hilarious. One of them is like, best horse on a stick I've ever seen. Another one is like, yes, it's a horse on a wooden post, but there's no toilet. But let me tell you why we have a horse here. We used to have a pub here called the White Horse. And um, I'll show you an image of what it would have looked like. Not, uh, not in the 19th century. I think that's uh, from the 1930s. But that was, um, that was here. And uh, the White Horse, it has, uh, well, it had a, a, an interesting landlord. His name was Mr. Ho. Mr. Ho was not exactly a Mr. Ho. It was, uh, it was a lady husband. The, uh, uh, the, that period of the... Uh, so that was in uh, 1745 that the pub uh, belonged to Mr. Ho. That period of history, there's quite a lot of stories of female uh, uh, transgenders or female tra like cross-dressing to, to go into the army or to, f to get some of the jobs for the men. Well, Mr. Ho was actually called Mary East. The story goes, 
um, well, at least what was published in the press at the time. I think sometimes the press is, well, very much, uh, you know, judging by the, 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 the period of, of history and stuff. But um, according to the press, Mary, as a teenage uh, uh, daughter, uh, teenage girl, she had been um, her and her friend, another Mary. Although in the original sources, the other girl has no name. Um, but she comes across as, as Mary Snaps in some of the versions. I think it might be Bram Stoker, because uh, Bram Stoker actually wrote about that couple in his book. Um, what was it called? famous imposters and I think it might be him that gave a name to the other girl because as far as I know in the ori original sources she was unknown but Mary and her girlfriend were um, disappointed by men I don't know why when you have a lesbian sto story they've always been disappointed by men you don't need to be disappointed by men to be a lesbian but hey ho and I don't know how disappointed by men you can you can be at the age of 16 but hey ho so they decided to live together as a couple but you couldn't really do that at the time, you know, if you wanted to have a career and, and all that. So they tossed a the coin. They tossed half a penny to decide which of them was going to have to, to uh, trans, uh, trans, um, transform as a man. And Mary East had to be the man. So she became James, James Ho. They got married in front of the, the Fleet Prison and um, they lived their lives. They actually bought a few pubs in, Hep in Epping, in Limehouse, and they ended up buying the White Horse. Now, uh, Mr. Ho, he, uh, he, he did everything as a man would do. He ended up taking some jobs for the parish. He was even a jury. At the time, to be a jury at, at court, you'd have to be a man. I mean, there were no ladies there. And um, they did live a fairly quiet life, you know. They didn't do massive uh, tea parties or whatever. But... Um, Apparently, one day, uh, a lady, Mrs. Bentley, recognized Mr. Ho. She used to know him as a child. And she blackmailed him. They paid, and she left him alone for a few years. And then later on, after Mrs. Ho died, so um, uh, Mr. Ho is now, is now uh, alone, that Mrs. Bentley came back, and she blackmailed him again, and she started to accuse him of random, random crimes. So... To, to come clean, to, to prove that it was not him, he came to court dressed as a lady. He came out, or she came out, as uh, Mary East. And she lived the rest of her life as Mary East. So I don't know if I should call her a he or a she, because, you know, we cannot... Today it's all about pronouns, but at the time there was no such thing, you know. So I don't know whether Mary was indeed a transgender and if she wished to be a man, or if it was just to be able to live her life. It looks like it was just to be able to live her life because the rest of her life she came out and she dressed as a woman and she behaved as a woman. So yeah, fascinating story. So if you fancy yourself a lady, a lady husband, it is possible here in, uh, in Poplar. Now, quick stop here. See this uh, uh, council estate? It's named Will, Will Crooks. I'm sure some of you might remember Will Crooks. Pisas, you should, because you share a, a last name. We've seen his grave when we did um, the Tower Hamlet Cemetery. Um, so Will Crooks was, uh, he was a dock worker and he was involved in the, um, in the, the famous dock strikes in 1889. And he, um, after the strikes, he, he became a leader of the Labour Party. So amazing uh, um, gentleman, the Labour Party has fairly recently rediscovered his grave, so they financed uh, the refurbishment of his grave, so you can still see it in the... Oh, you remember Pisas? Well done. <laughs> anyway, let's get back to Elizabeth. So, so she's still with John. They, uh, they bought a second coffee house, so it's basically straight down there to the right. That business is not going very well either. And they start to have some frictions between, between her and, um, and, uh, 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 and her husband. Um, now, we don't know why they split it up. It's probably one of the many reasons might be that they didn't, they, they didn't manage to have a family. Um, and also, um, John's dad, that was fairly wealthy, he owned a, fl a, a full street in Sheerness. It was called uh, Stride Row. He, um, in his will, 
he gave nothing to John, not a penny. He gave everything to the other brothers, well, mainly those that stayed in, uh, in Sheerness. All, her, all his boys that left for London, he didn't give them a penny. And that's when they closed down their, their second coffee house. So we can, we don't know for sure, but we can imagine that John might have done a few um, mortgages or, or borrowed some money. He was probably hoping for an in, uh, inheritance one day. And when he got nothing, he went out of business. And the, the relationship was starting to sour between the two. So they broke up and um, Elizabeth ended up on the streets for a little while. And that's when she started to scam people. She started to tell everyone that she was a victim of the Princess Alice disaster. Now, there's no evidence that she got any official funds. There were some funds organized by the, you know, the parish and all that. She probably just played on people's generosity, on people's um, uh, uh, sentiments, you know. So she told everyone that um, with John, she had nine children, nine of them. And uh, John was working on the Princess Alice. Um, we can see how she would have imagined in that because he came from Sheerness. That's where the Princess Alice was uh, going to uh, each day. And the day of the crash, she would have lost uh, uh, all her kids. Um, and uh, 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 she had, so at that point, she started to have, you know, syphilis after, after many years, it starts to attack the soft uh, tissues in your face. So you start to have some physical marks of the disease. So she actually made up a full story that she tried to grab a rope to go up the Duke of Tech. That was a second ship from the same company that, that followed the Princess Alice. So the Prince of Tech actually tried to get a few of the survivors. And she was trying to climb on a rope when the guy on top of her kicked her in the mouth. So, she, so that's, how she, that's how she explained her face that looked a little bit... Um, her face was actually ravaged by the syphilis, but that, that way she had an excuse for those uh, scarring. And because she would have lost her husband and all those kids, of course, people were a bit generous, you know, whether they bought, they bought her a pint of beer, a cup of tea, or, or they, they gave her actual money. Um, so that's how she managed, she managed to, to, to survive. Uh, she also started maybe soliciting, we don't know for sure, but also... Um, taking a few jobs for the, you know, around Spitalfield, there was a lot of the Jewish community and during Shabbat, they have to hire people to do the, the stuff for them. So she sometimes worked for them on a Saturday. The moment of truth is that, yes, hey, let's go into the graveyard. It's, uh, I didn't know whether it'll be open because it's no longer a church. It is, um, uh, well, I think it's a youth center or a community center of, of some sort. So I might get told off because I don't know if I should be here. But I'm going to show you the graveyard because Mary East, a.k.a. Mr. Ho, that's where she's buried. There's no monument. Uh, well, not that I know of, but she was buried here somewhere. Kill. So beautiful, uh, beautiful little churchyard. The church is cool as well, but I don't think it's a church at all anymore. I think it's a community center. Let's see if we can or not exit this way. I don't know whether it'll be open. So yes, yeah, so that's uh, that's that's when she's she's un ended up on the streets for the first time, and then she actually got back with John for a little while, and then they they, they broke up again, and uh, and that's when she ended up on the streets of. Uh, uh, of Whitechapel for good. Is that closed? Yes, it looks closed to me. Okay, we're gonna go back through the <laughs> other gate and I think I'm gonna have to get my umbrella out. Bear with me, it's starting to rain for real now. Up. All done. Up. Good. One second. Oops. Yeah. There we go. So, um, so yeah, she's uh, at that point. She's ended up on the streets of Whitechapel for 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 good. Um, she she might have been getting a little bit of a pension from uh, for, from John. Um, 
but not uh, not enough and she ended up mainly in a lodging house on uh, at 32 flower on dean street so we've been uh, around there in my uh, jack the ripper tour and uh, she she probably is soliciting at that point she actually did uh, get arrested for soliciting so she probably was uh, on and off uh, uh, doing the doing the job and let me get out of here do, do, do. oops hold on uh, uh, uh. There we go. There we go. And then she met uh, another partner called Michael Kidney. So um, he uh, he didn't seem to know much about her life. She had managed to stay very very private about her life. He believed she was in her thirties when she was in her forties at the time, and. Um, she seemed to be, uh, she kept reinventing herself, really. She, um, she, uh, she gave people different identities, so it seems like she doesn't really have any very, very close friends in, uh, in Whitechapel at that point. And little pause in the story to show you the, uh, this beautiful building. So this used to be the Poplar Town Hall. So today it's a, it's a, a hotel. It's known as the um, Lansbury Hotel because of, well, I suppose it's because uh, after George Lansbury, he was, um, uh, well, he had been the mayor of Poplar. Poplar is no, um, is no longer a borough, so this is no longer the town hall. We are now in city of Hamlet borough. We might have spoken about that in some of my tours. Uh, in 1965, a lot of the boroughs were matched uh, together. So we went from having over 80 boroughs to, down to 32. So, um, the, uh, the, you know, Poplar was a very poor, uh, a very poor district. And um, in the 1920s, we had here what they called the Poplar Rate Rebellions. It was basically organized by George uh, Lansbury. And the, um, well, he basically pushed local people not to pay their taxes. I think he went to prison himself for doing so. Because, you know, when you pay your local taxes, um, it goes to your local borough, but it also goes to the greater London uh, authorities as well. And, and he believed it was unfair that the poorest borough in London would have to pay, uh, you know, to pay for other boroughs as well, you know. Um, so he wanted the local tax to stay, with, to stay with the local community, basically. So uh, him, amazing uh, gentleman. He became a leader of the Labour Party as well, a bit like, uh, oops, let me cross, a bit like um, Will Crooks. Anyway, so the second uh, coffee house they opened, it was just across the street there. There's nothing to see today, but that would have been the site. Anyway, let's get back to, uh, to Elizabeth. Um, at that point, she was, well, sadly, she had taken um, a, bit of a, a bit of a habit into uh, scamming people, really. Let me show you, that's the mortuary. So that's where they take the bodies of the victims for found anywhere and the coroner's house as well and uh, so yeah she's uh, she's probably um selling her body but she's probably also scamming a lot of people she we have some uh, witness that said one day she had a baby with her and she was begging with a baby that was a technique at the time a lot of um, a lot of people were actually renting a baby from a baby farmer to go and beg. Because if you were struggling with a baby, you're much, um, you're much more likely to attract some kind of uh, charity for, for, for people. And uh, the, um, the, the, the charity did not stop there. She actually met a lady called Mary Malcolm. Mary was a, she was a tailoress and she had lost most of her eyesight, um, probably with, you know, like when you look at the needles and you're trying to do sewing in the dark. And um, so she couldn't see very well. And one day she ran into Elizabeth and she might have said Elizabeth because her sister was called Elizabeth. And Elizabeth turned around. And she actually managed to convince the lady that she was indeed her sister Elizabeth. So for many months, those ladies would meet Mary and Elizabeth, her sister, her fake sister. And she managed to get some money out of her fake sister. 
So she managed to scam her for money as well. We're talking about um, about maybe fifty dollars a week in today's money. So that's that's quite a lot. And Mary Malcolm, she told the the, the police after after all that that she did have some doubts and she couldn't wait to get rid of her every week. She never brought her home or she, did, she never even introduced her to her husband. So she probably did have some doubts. And the stories of her sister, so her sister was also um, quite a, a, a bit of a drinker and she was, um, she was also, uh, well, she had a, a husband that was in a shipwreck. And that mixed with the fake story of Elizabeth uh, being under Princess Alice's uh, disaster. Um, so yeah, she was uh, scamming that lady for money as well. So she became a bit of a con artist, let's, let's face it. And that's part of the reason why, personally, I'm not convinced that she was a Ripper victim. Because she's the only one that was not disassembled, you know, and apparently the blade, the, the knife was probably not the same. So there could be quite a few people that had some reason to hate her. Imagine, imagine you, if you are the husband of Mary Malcolm and you found out that your wife has been given 50 quid a week to a, a fake uh, sister. And on top of that, Michael, um, Michael, uh, uh, her boyfriend, he started developing syphilis. It, it couldn't be from, from Elizabeth because she, she was no longer contagious at that time. Um, she probably did start to have neuronal syphilis though. Uh, after, after many years, syphilis does attack the brain and she did have some kind of seizures. And um, uh, uh, it's not like if she could have had epilepsy because she didn't have it when she was young, you know. So it probably was the symptoms of, uh, of late syphilis, you know, confusion and, and, uh, and seizures. Um, so she, you know, imagine maybe Michael thought he got syphilis from her. You know, there, there are many people that could have had some reason to, um, to want to have a go at her. So, yeah. And uh, um, one night in that, uh, in that uh, lodging house, uh, the, the, the famous doctor, Dr. Bernardo, came to visit. He was, um, for the ones that don't know Bernardo, he was into uh, ch children charities. And he used to um, uh, care about those kids that ended up in the workhouse or in those uh, lodging houses. He came to interview some of the ladies in the kitchen there. And he's um, uh, fairly convinced that he might have met Elizabeth Stride there. And she would have told him, talking about Jack the Ripper, oh, one of us could be, could be killed next. We all up to no good and nobody cares what becomes of us. If we had helped the life of us years ago, we would have never come to this. So, you know, it could have been, it, it could have been Liz, but it could have been anybody, you know. Uh, most of those ladies were in terrible conditions and most of those ladies um, probably could have been helped indeed. How did you do that at the time? Oh, um, uh, what is that, Sarah? I think I've missed, uh, I'm not sure what we're talking about at the moment. And we are now in front of the, the Poplar's bus, so that's a, a leisure center. And, uh, and this is Hector, the dog. I think this guy was a ship owner or something, but I know he's with, um, with his dog. So he worked at the dock and he was uh, a philanthropist as well, Richard Green, in that period where the docks were so poor and Poplar was so poor. So he's here with, um, with his dog, Hector. So yeah, anyway, uh, one night Liz went out. We don't know if it was to solicit or maybe she had a, an appointment with somebody. Um, or, 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 or we don't know, but that night she did not come home. And very sadly, her body was found dead in a little, uh, in a little courtyard just outside a, a working man's uh, pub. And uh, she was the first one of the night of the double event. So the official version is that she might have been killed and the Ripper might not have had the time he wanted to do his weirdest fantasies because he might have been interrupted. So that would explain why she had only, only, <laughs> she had her throat cut but no, um, uh, no um, ripping. Uh, she kept her, her organs, her uterus. Um, who knows? It could be because indeed the Ripper was interrupted and then he, he ran to the city of London where he struck again. 
or it could be because it was a different killer. To this day, we still don't know. We still don't know for sure whether Elizabeth was indeed a Jack the Ripper victim. Most tripologists agree that she was, but does it matter? No. She was a very unfortunate lady that had a fascinating life and a very unlucky and sad life, and she did lose her life at the end of a man or a woman. We don't even know for sure, but most likely at the end of a, a man brutally in the streets of Whitechapel. Anyway, it's going to be the end of the tour. Let me know if you have any questions. If not, thank you very much for, uh, for coming today. If you wanted to see a bit more of me, well, tomorrow I'm throwing the dice on the board, on the Monopoly board, to, uh, to see which Monopoly location we're exploring next time. And, uh, or maybe an alien, yes. Or um, Tuesday we're going to Budapest, but that's a special one. I'm not going to tell you about any local history. I'm going to tell you about my experience as a medical tourist going for surgery abroad. And, uh, and in the coming week, I've got two, uh, two tours uh, abroad as well. So hope you'll join me for that. If you were completely new to me, I uh, hope uh, I got you hooked and you might, ge you might uh, give me a little uh, follow or subscribe. And if any of you left me a little tip on PayPal or, or, or um, buy me a coffee, thank you very much. Uh, you're very much uh, appreciated. Um, I know I cannot say thank you live because I don't see them live, but uh, it's really thanks to you that we can uh, keep on doing those, uh, uh, the research and uh, preparing for new tools. So, so thank you very much. Thanks, Tish. Thanks, Rosemary. Thanks, Sandrine. Cool. I don't see any questions, so I'm going to let you go. Have a great evening, a great morning, whatever time it is for you, wherever you are in the world. And I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.